On this episode, we delve into the origins of how the Mafia came to the forefront of boxing. Everything from fixed fights to paid off referees, greedy managers, misused boxers and of course the mobsters who controlled it all. This is Boxing and the Mafia on the Darker Side of Boxing. for the darker side of boxing and it's a completely different one yet again for you guys to listen to this one is all about boxing and the mafia a subject that has always gone hand in hand throughout the years corruption has it always been rife well of course we're going to be discussing this throughout the course of the episode johnston boxing and the mafia some great documentaries out there synonymous with the sport throughout its entirety even today some of us still believe that corruption is, is rife in the sport, but what a great episode to be doing for the series and one that has always gone hand in hand together. They, they really have, mate. Boxing and the Mafia, it just it really does seem to go hand in hand. And I mean, the, the, what we're going to go through in this episode, uh, you know, it touches on corruptness, obviously, clearly. That's what the Mafia were about. And uh, it is quite funny because, as you mentioned, that there is, it's still there today, I uh, you know, have, has boxing ever actually shaken off that dark cloud of the mafia? Um, I mean, we can go into that. We've got some fascinating stories and some great insights into basically what the mafia did and how they, how they got into boxing and some of the dodgy dealings they did within it. So there's plenty of examples in the episode for us to go through with regards to boxing and the mafia and, and how it all came to be about and notable incidents that many fight fans will be very much aware of but there's probably some that you might not be aware of which we've been happy to really bring to the table for this episode and there's going to be a few poignant moments in history that we believe has changed the landscape of boxing and we're going to start first and foremost with the black socks scandal so the first incident was more of a learning curve for the mobsters. And it happened a year after the Great War had ended in November 1918. So the World Series final between the eventual winners, the Cincinnati Reds and the Chicago White Sox in Major League Baseball became one of the most famous ball games in sporting history. But not because of the play on the field. It would be at the centre of a match-fixing scandal where eight members of the White Sox team were accused of throwing the series in exchange for money from a gambling syndicate led by Arnold Rothstein, nicknamed The Brain. Now, he was a, an American racketeer, businessman and gambler who became a kingpin of the Jewish mob in New York City. Now, Rothstein was widely believed to have organised corruption in professional athletics, including the fix of the 1919 World Series, along with co-conspirator, the former world featherweight champion, A. Battle. Although it's not boxing related, this is a poignant moment because I think, you know, with it being 1919 and I'm not necessarily saying that the mob wasn't involved in boxing before this. I'm sure we could probably find information. We didn't quite source that for this. So I think... For the for the first point, I think with it being Arnold Rothstein as well, a fan, you know, a, a famous gangster mobster, which we'll go into in a minute. But so touching on the Black Sox scandal with the White Sox franchise, they were the current in the best in the league. Their owner Charles Comiskey did not treat his players with the respect they deserved. With many baseball historians arguing that his behaviour actually led to the players to take a bribe. Now the team had plenty to complain about following the war attendances basically they dropped so the owners or the owner cut the players salaries but the attendances did rise and Comiskey actually refused to bring the salaries back up to the previous level now considering that he had some of the best players in the country on his payroll he would pay them below what the players of comparable talent were earning elsewhere 
You know, these these if you think about it, these are probably like your Manchester City and Manchester City players in football, for instance, for those that sort of enjoy football, not getting the salaries that they're on uh, compared to someone like say a Tottenham. Um, it would it would seem unfair. I mean, there was a shitload of money back then. It was hardly much, but they also had the filthiest uniforms in the league as well because Kaminsky actually basically wanted to cut his laundry bill. So, I mean, this guy was a tight ass. Let's get it right. And uh, socks. Uh, first baseman uh, named Chick Gandil and a professional gambler named Sport Sullivan actually discussed the possible fix with another gambler, now which was sleeping Bill Burns, who actually got in on the act as well. Now, Burns and his associate, Billy Mahug, set off for New York to meet Rothstein in an attempt to raise $100,000 to begin a possible fix. So Burns and Marag were directed by Rothstein, the track restaurant, where he would dispatch his right-hand man, Abe Attell, to meet with them and find out what they had in mind. Now, when Attell reported back to Rothstein about the plan to fix the series, he was sceptical and decided against it, but Attell saw an opportunity to make some big money, and he decided to take it on himself. Now, it wasn't long before Rothstein would eventually get involved with the fix and be a key figure in some of the alleged decisions, like making sure the series didn't go nine games and that the final game was thrown in the first innings. In the end, they all got caught apart from Rothstein, who actually ended up making a reported $350,000, but some believe he actually made more. He was also a mentor to some of the most influential crime bosses of their time, including Lucky Luciano, Maya Lansky, Frank Costello, Dutch Schultz and Owen Madden. Now, following the difficulty of fixing the World Series, Rothstein did make a move into boxing, amongst other sports, where it would be a lot easier and less complicated to fix fights. Rothstein and Attell used Lindy's on 7th Avenue and 53rd Street as a place where you could get bagels, booze and tips on fights. Rothstein would even sit ringside at Madison Square Garden, handing out treats and favours to whoever he chose. (laughs) Brilliant. Absolutely class, isn't it? Difficult to fix a World Series with that amount of players. I think that's pretty clear to see. So they decided to, to go into boxing. The next key point in terms of what, what we believe led the Mafia into boxing. And obviously the World Series being a bit difficult to fix, as, as I mentioned, uh, being there so many players, boxing a little bit easier, one-on-one, on one, you can ask someone to take a dive or you can take a cut of their wage. Now the next point, which we believe assisted the mob's infestation into boxing, was prohibition. Now one of the key reasons for the mob moving into boxing came when Andrew John Volstead, a Republican lawyer from Minnesota, and Wayne Wheeler from Ohio, of the Anti-Saloon League voted in the 18th Amendment to the Constitution in January 17, 1920 for the banning of manufacture and consumption of any drink containing more than 0.5% alcohol. In New York, authorities closed down 15,000 licensed premises before pouring the booze into the Hudson River, kick-starting the National Prohibition of Alcohol. Now, American economist Mike Fulton was the one who called it the National Prohibition of Alcohol. The reason was to reduce crime, corruption, solve social problems, reduce tax burden created by prisoners and poor houses and improve health and hygiene in America. Instead, it spawned the most complete expansion of organised gangsterism the world had ever seen. And that was actually said by Kevin Mitchell, who was the author of Jacob's Beach, The Mob, The Garden and The Golden Age of Boxing. Not long after the Volstead Act began, 30,000 speakeasies opened their hidden doors and within five years, that number grew to 100,000. Kevin Mitchell explained brilliantly the carnage that prohibition had caused. And this is what he said. Prohibition gave birth to the mob as we know it. It changed the morale landscape forever. Legal jobs disappeared. Decent people were driven to crime. What was considered wrong once become the norm. 
stealing, casual violence and deceit spread. And most tellingly, so lucrative was bootlegging, the perverse of the established mobsters, that they would turn themselves into a business. This was the genesis of organised crime in America. The phenomenon grew with names attached called the Syndicate, the Outfit, and chillingly, their dedicated killing unit, Murder Incorporated. If you've not heard the story of, of how a lot of these organised criminal gangs came about, this pretty much sums it up, really, the prohibition. Basically, they took a lot of things away from a lot of people, which led them to go down a different route to be able to make a living. And it, it opened the doors for mobsters to be able to get the organised crime syndicates going. And this is exactly what started with with boxing when they moved over to boxing now we're going to move into another point about a certain name we brought to you a little bit earlier which was owen madden and we're going to talk about his rise now at the start of the century the new york state athletic commission was formed in 1920 to oversee the walker law which was a piece of legislation that entertained professional fighting as long as it subscribed to the law's jurisdiction of the commission now, a year later, the rest of Fighting America set up the National Boxing Association, which we will know as the NBA, not the NBA as in the basketball, <laughs> the NBA, what used to be known as like the NBA heavyweight title. Now, that served to encourage the mobsters to move into boxing, while Al Capone bullied his way into the affections of promoters and managers in Chicago, Owen Madden, who was actually a Yorkshireman born here in the UK, in Leeds, but made in New York, was beginning his rise to her ascension in New York City. Now, Madden was raised by Irish parents on 10th Avenue in Hell's Kitchen, in the West Side slum that Irish refugees from the Potato Famine had made their own. His friends called him Oni, and while he was growing up in the company of Arnold Rothstein, Luciano, Jack Legs Diamond and Dutch Schultz, he also became known as The Killer. A graduate of the gopher gang who earned his reputation as a madman that would not stop at nothing once his temper got the better of him. It was his temper that got him a nine-year stint in prison for the murder of a rival gang member. He was released in 1923 from the Sing Sing Correctional Facility and hooked up with Joe Gould, a small-time boxing hustler who had been instructed by Schultz to collect Oni from prison, along with convicted murderer Arthur Beeler. So Owen, he was advised to join Schultz's bootlegging operation, uh, but he was actually more interested in opening his own brewery. So within weeks, he was released. A guy called Ewan O'Hare, who was a fellow Irish-American. Schultz had basically hired on Madden's patch following his stint in prison, his little stint he had. And he was actually found swimming with the fishes on the Lower West Side. His brewery occupied a building on the lower west side in Chelsea on 10th Avenue, 26th and 27th Streets, and it had become Madden's patch once again. But this time, he was rolling in it. And Costello, uh, as in Frank Costello, Madden and Schwartz alliance was at its peak. So the three of them had basically combined. Now, Madden, his beer was actually called Madden's number one. And I, I, did, I did read that someone said, like, why would you not change your name? We'll take your name off the bottle because it's pretty obvious that it's you that's going to be bootlegging his stuff. And he didn't care. Uh, he had the police in his pocket. And by all accounts, apparently it was decent. Now, the Manhattan Beer Wars actually began between a guy called Charles Vanny Higgins on one side with Costello Madden and Schwartz on the other. Now, it was in 1928 that one of Costello's delinquents a certain Frankie Carbo, who will come up very sh very soon, or, or a lot in this, was beginning to make a name for himself. He tried to intimidate a cab driver by demanding protection money, but he was not willing to buckle. Instead, the cabbie actually confronted Carbo with a muscular friend called Albert Weber, which resulted in Weber being shot dead. Carbo was actually charged with his murder, but it was later reduced to manslaughter, and a mob co connection had clearly intervened with the law and he was released early and when he was released from again the same place that madam was in sing sing probably the, the same place where they probably met and become friends he had actually only just served an 18 month 
prison sentence of his four-year sentence. This, as I mentioned earlier, will not be the last time we hear of a certain Frankie Carbank. Now, Gould and Madden became close associates together. They would extort businesses for protection, and in exchange, they would give a load of Madden's beer to sell. Now, during much of the 20s, even when the Great Depression hit America in August of 1929, Madden had earned enough from strike-breaking and bootlegging to purchase the Cotton Club, which was previously known as the Club Deluxe, from the former world heavyweight champion, a certain Jack Johnson. Now, it was located on the corner of 142nd Street and Lennox Avenue in the heart of Harlem. The two arranged a deal that allowed Johnson to remain the club's manager, with Madden using the Cotton Club as an outlet to sell his number one beer to the Prohibition crowd. Now, Oney is sometimes overlooked in the history of gangsters who were associated with boxing. He already had a large piece of Max Bayer, and he also had a cut or controlled dozens of fighters, which included Johnny Wilson, Maxie Rosenblum, Kid Francis, Gene Tunney, Bob Olin, Charlie Phil Rosenberg, Ace Hudkins, Leo Lomsky, and Marty Golden. Two of his managerial fronts were Joe Jacobs, who was most famous for handling Max Schmeling in the US, and his long-time associate, Gould, who had managed James J. Braddock, a.k.a. the Cinderella Man. Yeah, it's interesting that Madden was a, was a name I didn't really know of, and I wouldn't be surprised if his influence on Carbo, I wouldn't be surprised if they met in Sing Sing. We don't know. Uh, roughly would have been in the same time in that Sing Sing penitentiary. And you do wonder, because when Carbo did come out, one of the first things Frankie Carbo did was look to get into boxing as early as this, the late not late nineteen twenty. So, I think Madden was a guy that was a clear influence on Carbo and someone that we definitely needed to to bring to light and someone that people just don't seem to recall when you think of the mafia because obviously he wasn't necessarily a mafia mafioso associate. But according to American journalist who was Jimmy Breslin, Madden took Damon Runyon, another American writer, and first to call. Broderick, the actual Cinderella man, to one of his fancy apartments, which was a penthouse on the London Terrace block on the 23rd and 9th Avenue, which actually oversees bootlegging operation. Stand at the apartment where Ray Arcel and his fighter, as you mentioned, Charlie Phil Rosenberg, one of his boys. Now, Madden actually arranged for Rosenberg to fight a guy called Eddie Cannonball Martin for the World Bantamweight title. Rosenberg was in his apartment because Madden basically wanted to keep a close eye on his diet. So on fight night, Madden bet $1,000 on Martin with the knowledge that Rosenberg had basically not been eating well. And he felt that he was going to lose. But what he didn't account for was cuts. And actually, Martin was actually cut to bits. And Madden actually lost his money. <laughs> it's just a story that I thought we'd just stick in there because it just shows you, again, it's just confirmation that these mobsters, although we know fixed fights was something that they tried to do, sometimes it ain't always going to go the way they expect it to go and they can't always manipulate proceedings even when it is a one-on-one and not like a baseball game. Well, this is it. The difficulty with boxing, of course, is that there's so many different variables to what can happen in a fight. Someone can get caught with a lucky punch and, and that's it. It's good night Vienna and it's all over. So it is a little bit difficult to manipulate, but easier if you've got both parties agreeing to, to, to look to throw a fight. Now, Madden... Well, I was at the height of his powers in the boxing scene and he actually managed to get a piece of the future world heavyweight champion, Primo the Gentle Giant, Khan Era, along with Schultz and Vincent Mad Dog Coll. Now, he ended up buying Canera's contract and began setting up fights with his right-hand man, French Lamange. Now, as far as the NBA were concerned, Khan Era, now an innocent participant in a series of fixed fights, was managed by Louis Scorese, Billy Duff and Walter Friedman. Now Madden and Demange directed Carnera through the rankings, making sure he would get his world title shot with the usual mob-style techniques of bribery, intimidation or whatever else they could use. Now in 1931, Frankie Carbo was once again charged with the murder. Now this time it was of a Philadelphia mobster, by the name of Michael Mickey Duffy in Atlantic City, New Jersey. However, Carbo was eventually released when FBI records disclosed his alibi 
Apparently, he was undergoing treatment at an air clinic and later begun working for Murder Incorporated under the boss at the time, which was Louis Lepke Bulchhalter, which I think is a lot of bullshit. He definitely wasn't getting his uh, his ears sorted out there, was he? <laughs> oh, I'd definitely say so. I mean, it, it just shows you again. I mean, these these it's almost like the alibis they put together as well. Like it was almost sticking one finger up at the FBI there as well because. Uh, they just took the absolute piss, let's be honest. And, you know, they were earning a fortune for this prohibition, bootlegging and God knows what else, racketeering, prostitutes, whatever whatever it was, that you can name it. And obviously certain guys up mad and then dipped his toes into boxing. Now, the year before Conera finally got the title shot, Madden was also involved in a murder of former associate Mad Dog Cole, who had been extorting money from several mobsters, including Demang and Madden. Now, the Great Depression ended on March 1933. Three months later, on June 29th, Madison Square Garden Bowl in Queens, New York, Carnera became a world heavyweight champion by knocking out Jack Sharkey in round six. By December 5th, the 18th Amendment was abolished and prohibition was formally ended in some states anyway. So it just shows you Madden, although he's involved in a murder, potentially... Now under investigation, depression comes to an end, prohibition's ended, and he's finally got a world heavyweight champion in Primo Canera, a guy he guarded through. So we've now got a mobster for the first time on record, in a way, with a fighter in Primo Canera who was mob-affiliated. So I think that's a definite poignant moment for the Mafia. They finally had a world heavyweight champion in their midst. Now, the Gentle Giant retained the world title against Paulino Oscudin and Tommy Loughran, but on June the 14th, 1934, against Max Bayer, Carnera was knocked down multiple times in 11 rounds before referee Arthur Donovan stopped the fight. By the time Primo Carnera had retired on April the 4th, 1941, he owned less than 10% of himself which is absolutely crazy. Now, Madden, on the other hand, may have lost his world heavyweight champion, but he still had a piece of the pie on Bayer through Billy Duff and Demange. Now, Max Bayer would lose his next fight to James Braddock in an upset win, a fight that has been rumoured to have been fixed, but no actual evidence is there to back up that theory. But with the psychopath Madden associated with Gould, the manager of Braddock, it really isn't too much of a far-fetched concept to actually think that that was potentially a fixed fight. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, the fact that Broderick, he didn't have the best of careers. I know he came back. He had a real, I mean, we know from Cinderella Man, he, he dropped down a bit and then he, he sort of went to work. Then he made his hand. I think it was his left hand a bit stronger, wasn't it? Because he broke his hand. I mean, when you watch the fight as well, you got to think Max Bear was knocking people out for fun. Um, I'm not saying Max would have necessarily thrown it, but it's weird. It's, it's a tricky one. I, I can understand where people would be coming from when they think of it. I don't know. It's a lovely story as well, isn't it? It makes for a nice story. Anyway, the, the money from boxing was good business for Madden, but his history came back to bite him with his ties to that murder of that mad dog, Cole, an old associate of his. Now, he was continuously pursued by police after the murder, although they could never convict him. And an Italian mafia family had also begun to encroach on his territory in Chelsea, in, in New York. And too far led enough of New York and he left Manhattan in 1935 for Hot Springs in Arkansas and I believe he stayed there to the moment he died well there you go that's a bit, uh, bit of a crazy story really with, with, with Madden isn't it again unless you've really dug into it unless you're a historian to the sport and you've been studying for 20-30 years <laughs> you're probably not going to know about Madden and his story and it was really good to get to know a little bit more about him in, in the early days in boxing during the sort of 1920s and, and 30s. Now, as we move on through the years, we move into a certain Uncle Mike and Joe Lewis next. Now, these are two names that we, we have discussed briefly in detail for our Legendary Nights episode, The Tale of Lewis versus Smelling. So we did put a bit of context to Uncle Mike and Joe Lewis's relationship in that episode, but this is going to give you listeners a bit more of an insight to the rise of Uncle Mike and Joe Lewis. So, obviously, we've just spoken about Madden leaving in 1935 for Arkansas, and with him out of the picture, Joe Gould was able to seize his opportunity within the boxing in New York. He was the man in charge of the new heavyweight champion in Braddock. 
and he certainly had friends in high places. He still had Madden, but he also knew Frankie Carbo, who by this point had been arrested 17 times and had been charged with another five murders. He also had friends in Frank Blinky Plumero, the associate of the Philadelphia crime family who ran the largest numbers racket in that city, and then we also had Frank Costello, who was now a big earner for the Luciano family with his slot machines, his bookmaking operations. And then the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah, this is a fascinating story, this one. Now, in the book, which is called Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of J. Edgar Hoover by a guy called Anthony Summers, there was an intriguing reference to what the mob knew about Hoover which they must have used to blackmail him, basically, and and it was it for their gain. And this is what it read. It said, The mob bosses were well-placed to find out about Edgar's compromising secret, and at a significant time in place. It was on New Year's Eve, 1936, after a dinner at Stalk Club, that Edgar was actually seen by two of Walter Winchell's guests holding hands with his lover, Clyde, Tolson. Now, Edgar was immensely vulnerable to observations by mobsters. Now, Jim Braddock, Frank Costello, and bootlegger Sherman Billingsley, who ran the stalk, were all present at the dinner, along with Winchell, who was known to be a bit of a gossip in private as well as in his column. By this point, Carby was a regular at the Cotton Club and the stalk. He was under the influence of Frank Costello, who Basically, if you read about Frank Costello, he wasn't a nice guy. And they were now muscling in on the operations of a certain Mike Jacobs, who we were going to in a sec, who showed no resistance. Instead, he actually formed a friendship of such and would continue to meet for discussions about the fight game. Now, what is interesting, I know it doesn't necessarily say that Edgar Hoover took a bribe or it, I think what it was, was the, the gangsters around, you're talking some of the biggest gangsters around in New York at the time, were at this dinner. They know that Hoover is homosexual and they held, I believe, I mean, there's, again, there's no conversations. It's just a, someone saying that they were seen together. And actually, Jim Broderick was actually sitting with them as well. So it, it's just interesting because Jim Broderick's always a guy that comes along as this Cinderella man, this nice fella, but yet, He's winding and dining with mobsters and the head of the FBI, who was homosexual, almost involved in a conspiracy to just let him know that we know that you're homosexual. And if you try and do anything to us, we'll gloss you up. Yeah, it certainly seems that way, doesn't it? It gives you that that feeling that maybe they kind of had this dirt on him that he didn't want to, to, to get out. And that's why he kind of turned a blind eye to a lot of shit that was going on at that period of time. Now, before we can progress with how the mob took complete control of boxing, we must describe the stories behind their appointment, starting with Irish Jewish Uncle Mike. Now, from a young age, Mike Jacobs was the original con man, touting outside the garden and turning $2 tickets into a $10 profit. He once said, after 16, I was never broke again. Now, it was during his teens that he met Tex Rickard, an American boxing promoter, founder of the New York Rangers at the NHL team, and builder of the third Madison Square Garden. Now, they actually met in Nevada in 1904, where Rickard promoted his first fight, which was a world title fight between Joe Gans and Barley Nelson. Now, following this meeting with Rickard, Jacobs returned to New York and he hooked up with journalist Bat Masterson, who was a former gunslinger, and Damon Runyon. Now, Masterson died of a heart attack in 1921 while writing his final column with Jacobs and Runyon becoming close friends ever since. Runyon, Ed Frain and Bill Fansworth wrote for the Hearst newspaper chain and in 1933 they arranged for Jacobs to stage Hearst's annual milk fund benefit with all the proceeds going to charity. The previous promoter of the charity's event was Madison Square Garden with Liverpudlian Jimmy Boy Bandit Johnston, their matchmaker from 1931 to 1937. Now, after the Garden, which at the time was the mecca of boxing, decided to stop supporting the Hearst Annual Milk Fund, Jacobs then stepped in and took over. Now, later that year, Jacobs and the three sports writers would then go on to originate the 20th Century Sporting Club, which become 
rival boxing promotion to Madison Square Garden. Mike Jacobs obviously using that charity to, for his game because obviously now Madison Square Garden and, and Johnston, uh, Jimmy Johnson have, have got competition. Now, this would not be the only time that Johnston would drop the ball by dropping that milk, the, the charity, and letting go of that and letting sort of Uncle Mike pick that up. It was actually during his, his time at, at the helm of the garden, his trouble and his biggest problem, as well as not supporting the charity, was the fact that he was a full-blown racist. And now, within the space of a year, there was a fire who was making a lot of noise over in Chicago. And his handlers, manager John Roxburgh and promoter Julian Black and trainer Jack Chappie, known as Chappie Blackburn, were on a mission to make him a superstar at the mecca of boxing, as in the garden. Now, Roxburgh did call Johnston to see if he could get his fighter a slot on the garden bill after a string of impressive wins, including two over a guy called Lee Ramage. Jim Johnston said in his words, this was again in Kevin Phillips's book, if he comes here, he will be, he'll be expected to lose a few. I don't care if he's knocked out Ramage. He's still coloured. Don't you have any white boys out there? So clearly he wanted Lewis to come over, lose a couple of fights. Obviously, they're not interested in that. What Johnson actually didn't know either was that Roxburgh was actually black himself. <laughs> it was as black as Joe Lewis. Obviously, speaking to him on the phone, he didn't realise this. And, uh, Joe Lewis, obviously, so, you know, he's dropped the ball. He's let Joe, Joe Lewis go. Now, he was looking for a promoter. And of, as we know, Joe Lewis would now go on to be one of the greatest heavyweights in boxing history. But they were out there and they were trying to find a, a, someone who can pick him up as a promoter and push him over in New York City, where which was basically the mecca of boxing at the time. And with Johnston's outright racism becoming a roadblock, they needed another promoter that could promote him. And the man they chose was Mike Jacobs, who got Roxburgh to sign Lewis up to the 20th Century Sporting Club in the summer of 1935. The next step was to promote him the right way by using his contacts at the Hearst newspaper chain and show Lewis in a good light, as well as making sure he ticks all the right boxes as a decent religious black civilian and be nothing like the last black world heavyweight champion jack johnson now lewis's first fight under jacobs was the six round demolition of primo carnera at the yankee stadium in june following another victory in august lewis then knocked out max bayer in four rounds before finally getting his fight for the first time at the garden in december which was another four round knockout of paulino erskudden now joe's career will be remembered for when he hit a stumbling block in January 1936. Something we've touched on in, in that Legendary Nights <laughs> episode, of course, was that shock defeat at the Yankee Stadium against the much unfancied Max Schmeling. Now, it was just as he turned 21 in 1935 that his fortunes took a turn for the worst. He was, quite frankly, done up like a kipper by the devious bastards that handled him. He was young, he was naive and trusting he allowed too much trust to those around him, and they took full advantage of that. He signed over half of his gross earnings for the following 10 years to his first manager, Julian Black. His other manager, Roxburgh, claimed a quarter for an indefinite period, and his trainer and so-called friend Chappie took his wages, which was the remaining quarter meant for Joe. And of course, the taxman would of course get their cut, leaving Joe with absolutely nothing. Now, although these guys were not mob men, they certainly did go about it in a mob-style way, skimming, as it's known, in gambling. Next up for a piece of Lewis was Joe Gould, and Jim Braddock's manager played a blinder. Initially, he got one of his mafioso cronies to pick up Roxburgh, demanding 50% of Joe. But that bastard managed to hold his own by saying, I can't do that, Joe. If you want to do a deal, you've got to talk to Mike. <laughs> They've all literally rinsed Joe Lewis before he's even a mega star. It's, it's, it's quite frankly, it's, it's dreadful. Gould wasn't best pleased with the fact that Roxburgh moved him on to Uncle Mike. So he headed to the garden to negotiate. Once again, we will refer to Kevin Mitchell's book, Jacob's Beach book, about a discussion they had. Mike, I'm a reasonable man, said Gould. I'll settle for 10%. Or there's no fight. 
Mike had connections too and wasn't phased by gold. Joe, you're crazy. There ain't no 10% to give you. Did Roxy not tell you that? Joe Lewis, so-called confidence, had already taken everything as you explained, Sean. We need something, Mike. We need something. You got it? We need it. Tell you what, Joe. We all need this fight. So I'll do this for you. You can have $1 for every 10 Uncle Mike earns with the title until some schmuck gets lucky and knocks him over. What'd you say? Joe Lewis is going to be around for a long time, Joe, and so is Uncle Mike. We're all going to earn some serious moolah here. Gould's response was swift. Done. That 10% that was never going to come out of Uncle Mike's earnings, but it would certainly come out of Joe's. So I believe it was 10% of the earnings that they would make from people coming to the fight, from attendances. For, and he would make sure that that bit of money would skim out of Joe's, not his own. Just like that, Joe Lewis would be fighting the next 10 years for peanuts while dancing to their tune and looking over his shoulder for the tax man, mafia-style extortion that Carbo would have been proud of. By 1938, Uncle Mike had his relationship with the garden changed from tenant-landlord to a boxing partnership. At about that time, Jacobs became the sole trader of the 20th Century Sporting Club, paying off Runyon and forcing out the other two partners. So, Uncle Mike, at this point, was clearly the man at the Garden and in New York. And he also had ties, obviously, with the Mafia. And he was rolling in it, while Joe Lewis was the guy in the ring earning absolutely nothing. It is just dreadful, it really is. Well, it's one thing for certain. Uncle Mike was one ruthless motherfucker in business. <laughs> what he just... this, this guy... He's an absolute asshole. When you when we talk about Dodgy Don King, Mr. Slippery, you think he's a bastard. Uncle Mike, come on, man. He, he's got to be the biggest bastard we've come across so far in, in all the podcast episodes that we've done. And now you've heard a bit more about Uncle Mike and his story. I think as a listener, I'm pretty sure you'll think to yourself the same thing, that this guy is a bastard. We're going to start calling him Uncle Mike the Bastard. That is his nickname from now on. Now, of course, at this point, he's in complete control of New York, or or so it seemed on the outside, but of course, we know now who really had control, and the mob could now start to plan their takeover. Kevin Phillips wrote about a place where the wise guys and the connected men would meet to discuss and plan the next moves, and he described its birth in 1935 when Uncle Mike... The bastard set up his ticket office. At the black heart of boxing's empire was Jacob's Beach. For 20 years, it was the only place to be for boxing stars and their camp followers. Geographically, it covered the stretch of pavement on West 49th Street between Broadway and 8th Avenue, with the Garden and Jack Dempsey's restaurant at either end of the block. Around about the middle was 220 West 49th, the ticket office of Mike Jacobs, the one-time scalper after whom it was named. No, it was the centre of boxing. It was the centre of the universe when it came to boxing. Journalists, gamblers, managers, underworld figures, and even hangers-on would all head over to the Forest Hotel to do their dirty business. The name was actually originated by a sports writer, either Runyon or Frank Graham or even Sid Mercer. Now, the post-fight den was Toot Shaw at 51 West 51st Street, which was owned by Bernard Toot Shaw, a former bouncer during the Prohibition. Now, as everyone knew, Joe Lewis battered Braddock in eight rounds to become the first black heavyweight champion since Jack Johnson in 1915. Lewis would continue to dominate the heavyweight division in a reign that lasted 140 consecutive months, during which he participated in 26 championship fights, while Uncle Mike, the bastard, would continue to control Joe, the division, and of course, the World Heavyweight Championship. And then of course you get your hangers on, who actually still got paid, whilst Gould and Braddock still got their 10%. It's incredible. I mean, wow. I mean, when you talk about Jacob's Beach as well, which Phillips describes brilliantly, and, and the fact that Jack Dempsey's restaurant, I mean, Jack Dempsey's restaurant is an, is rumoured also to have been a drop for the mob where they would go and drop their money that he'd keep it and then the next whoever would come and pick up the money. Apparently true. Uh, so Jack Dempsey 
after his boxing career had his ties. Everybody was involved and we will go into that. So everyone's basically, ex- the extortion for Mr. Joe Lewis is just dreadful. And the fact that he was loved by the country, by America, and yet they just rinsed him completely for everything he had and then allowed him to just get chased by the tax men. I think, I believe the Inland Revenue actually apologised to Joe Lewis when he was all over and said and done. They realised that he was just absolutely rinsed. And uh, it, well, I mean, we'll go into it a little bit further, but wow. So Uncle Mike dominating. Everything seems to be going well. But then we have the birth of the International Boxing Club. Now, and also, obviously, the Second World War interrupted Joe's dominance on September 1st, 1939. And once again, he would find himself getting extorted, this time by the tax man. This is where I believe the Inland Revenue did apologise for. So Lewis participated in an exhibition and title fights during his spell in the army. He actually raised $100,000 for a relief fund that was taxed, even though he never saw a single penny of it. Lewis met Jackie Robinson who was during the war and uh, he was the he was the guy that became the first black player in major league baseball and it was through robinson that joe met an attorney and his name was truman k gibson jr now in 1940 gibson was summoned to washington to act as an advocate for the african american soldiers and he would go on to defend robinson after he took a stand against some white soldiers who had racially assaulted him when the war ended on September 2nd, 1945, Joe managed to acquire the services of Gibson as his attorney. He actually kicked Julian Black to the curb after a fallout and a hot, and he actually hired a new manager. His new manager was a guy called Marshall Miles. And unfortunately, again for Joe, he was actually a well-connected boxing man. And after Roxy ended up in the nick, that bastard as well. So Roxy gets <laughs> nicked. He, he kicks uh, Julian Black out. Brings in Gibson Jr., who seems to be, you know, this this fantastic lawyer by the sounds of it. I mean, political as high as politicians. And then you bring in Marshall Mills, Miles, sorry, who was a well-connected mafioso. So again, probably not the best of replacements for Joe. That's <laughs> just how it was for the for the poor fella. Well, it's safe to say uh, at this point in time, Joe Lewis. It's quite simply having his trousers pulled down and being absolutely fisted from behind when it came down to his earnings. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, I think the next piece of information that we're going to present to you is actually going to make the rest of you cheer with delight. Because in 1946, that bastard, Mike Jacobs, actually suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. But even though he'd suffered that hemorrhage and didn't die, he remained the head of the organisation with his relative, Sol Strauss, operating the club on a day-to-day basis. But he was not as astute as Uncle Mike, and he would be easy pickings for the next organisation to step in and take over. Now, the idea came from Truman Gibson, a man who'd served on two presidential advisory committees and was the first black American to win the Presidential Medal of Merit, and he was now in a position to bring his legal and business brain into play. Now, considering that Lewis had been shafted, mobster style, he never knowingly dealt with the mob. But things changed. Firstly, Joe, with Gibson, teamed up with Lewis Greenberg and Johnny Roberts in a brewery business. But that turned bad after Greenberg's picture was published in Life magazine alongside Al Capone. (laughs) Now, Greenberg was the treasure for Capone in his bootlegging operation. So then, of course, Joe's reputation took an absolute battering because of that judgment that he'd made. But he trusted in Gibson. So with Uncle Mike poorly and Joe Gould sentenced to three years hard labour after a court martial in 1944 for conspiracy to accept bribes, a publisher of Hearst Herald American, George DeWitt, made contact with Gibson regarding the Hearst Milk Fund that had helped Jacobs wrangle his way into the garden. Now, this charity was legitimate, but it was a way of keeping cash reserves in the boxing industry, probably untaxed. Now, DeWitt then introduced Gibson to Harry Voyler, who was a member of Al Capone's gang. Now, Voyler had assisted the Hearst newspaper during the strike, so DeWitt was probably returning the favour by introducing the two. Voyler then offered $250,000 for Joe Lewis's contract, which was accepted, but the, did- the deal actually didn't materialise. Now, Gibson, Marshall, Miles, Lewis, 
and publicity man Harry Mandel went to plan B instead, and it was Mandel that decided to make contact with Jim Norris, who was an entrepreneur in Detroit, Chicago and New York, and he had plenty of money. His friends were mobsters and gamblers, liquor sellers and casino owners, fighters, managers and promoters. Norris was a student of the game, but he had a love for it since witnessing Dempsey Willard in 1919. Yeah, funny, uh, Norris also was uh, this Dempsey Willard fight. There's a few others that were around at the time and, and, and they watched this fight. Either way, Gibson knew that Joe Lewis was on a decline following a sluggish performance against Jersey Joe Walcott in December 1947. He came away with a very controversial victory before winning a rematch in the summer of 1948. The idea was for Joe to rest up and let the challengers battle it out in a series of fights that would create maximum interest in about some way down the road for the heavyweight title. Gibson pitched his idea to Norris and his partner, partner at the time, who was Arthur Wurtz, I believe he was his partner throughout, explaining that he had already signed leading contenders, Walcott and Ezard Charles. He agreed and promised Joe $20,000 a year for his title and the International Boxing Club was born on March 1949. With Joe announcing his retirement for the second time, the IBC then brought out Mike Jacobs, who was obviously unwell, who quit the Guardian following a stroke. Hey. Um, <laughs> and uh, Norris and Gibson stepped into the boxing hot seat as the lead promoters. Now, Norris and Gibson now had the maker of boxing. What they needed next was a TV deal, which had been booming since 1946. Gibson had a contract in Bob Kinter, president of the American Broadcasting Company, otherwise known as ABC. They struck up a deal to broadcast fights on a Saturday and Monday nights, although during the late 40s they would develop the Friday night fights. Now The IBC were paid $40,000 a week for their fights. Gibson says 60% of that money went to the fires, And if a fighter was top of the bill at the Garden or in Chicago, they'd actually earn $7,000 each. So matchmaking was now the next challenge. Knowing that they had limited time left with Joe Lewis, to be matched at the Garden, a fighter's manager had to be fully paid up participant to organisation misleadingly called the International Boxing Managers Guild. Now the author, Kevin Mitchell, describes what it meant to be associated with a guild. And he said it was everything to do with the strong arm tactics of the mob, more specifically of Carbo. If you did not agree to the terms of the guild, if you did not sign with a manager from the guild, if your manager did not agree to parcel off bits of you to unseen, unlisted shadow investors, or if you did not agree to fight when, where and how was con- it was convenient for others, you did not appear on television at all. Now, if you did not make it onto the TV, you were consigned to the outer limits. Now, boxing in front of the dwindling audiences and, and small venues. So, in other words, it was a case of, if you don't adhere to these rules of this guilt, you ain't getting on the TV. You're going back to the small halls, you're making absolutely no money whatsoever, and it's it's very likely that you'll never get to that stage ever again. You're probably never going to get a world title shot if you're a really good fighter. So you're literally in the position where you either accept everything on that list Or your career never goes anywhere. And that's exactly what it was. The Boxing Managers Guild was set up that basically, as he said, strong-armed the mob and specifically Carbo. I mean, it's it's brilliant, really. The fact that they had this TV deal as well, big money. They didn't even need to worry about the attendances. I believe the attendances took a little drop. Gil Clancy said the attendances weren't great. But because of the money from the TV deals, they didn't care. The mob didn't care. They were lining their pockets. They didn't give a shit about boxing. They just cared about earning the money. And they had a piece of every fighter that signed up to the guild. And no doubt everyone's going to do it. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? You know, if you're an up-and-coming fighter, you're going to, aren't you? Now, Lou Duva was actually born in 1922 and had fought, trained, managed, promoted for nearly 70 years in his native New Jersey and was actually a close friend of Rocky Marciano as well. Now, he spoke to Kevin Mitchell about the Guild and its connections with the mob. And he said, you had to have connections. They'd come over and say, I've got a part of you. There were good fighters around. And if you wanted to go to the Garden, they had the connection. If you wanted to go anywhere at all, you had to have the connection. Duva continued. 
It was a case of control. And the guys that worked behind the guild were the guys that controlled it. Mob guys controlled the guild. And they usually were strong enough to make their guy the matchmaker in the garden or in any of the other clubs. So fighters actually had their contracts sold as well to connected faces. So you sign up to the guild, but your manager's in control of you. And your manager then decides he's going to sell part of you to some wise guy. But they were the front men. There was basically no alternative for fighters. If they wanted to try and make a successful career in boxing, they had to have a manager. Their manager had to sign up to the guild, who was then basically your money from your fighters are getting skimmed by mobsters. I mean, it's, it's genius. Let's be clear about it. I mean, it is absolute genius. There was no escape in the mob during the 50s unless you had star attraction where you could bring fans to your fights. Because that was the other thing, as, as, as Gil Clancy said, the attendances weren't great unless you was a big name. And the only guys that were able to do that was Joe Lewis, even though he was really at the end of his career, he was still able to generate a large attendance. Jake LaMotta, because they just loved to watch his style. Rocky Marciano, uh, later on, obviously not at this point, but we'll speak about Marciano. And obviously Sugar Ray Robinson. If you were these guys, you had a chance, but it was a very small percentage of fighters that didn't necessarily need to sign up with a mob. It, it was genius, and you know, and what they were doing for them. But in, in in terms of morals, they're absolutely no morals whatsoever. The morals were swimming with the fishes, like a few of their fucking murder victims as well, <laughs> down in down in the fucking Hudson River. So there's no chance in hell that you was ever going to get anywhere in boxing, like you say, unless you were an absolute star in your own right, which made it very difficult for some of the fighters around at that time. Now the point man. For the mob, at this point in time, was the star of boxing, Mr. Frankie Carbo. Carbo was part of one of the five New York Mafia families, the Le- Chassis crime family, and as previously mentioned, a known capo who had operated as a gunman with Murder Inc. before transitioning into one of the most powerful behind-the-scenes promoters in professional boxing. Murder Inc. were an organised crime group that acted as the enforcement arm of the Italian-American Mafia and the Jewish mob, originally known as the Bugs and Mayer mob, which was founded by Mayer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, before it was rebranded following the creation of the commission spearheaded by Lucky Luciano. In a twist, it's been claimed that Cabo was actually responsible for murdering Bugsy Siegel in Beverly Hills, California in 1947, under the orders of Mayor Lansky. Some also believe it was a small-time wannabe mobster, Eddie Canazaro, who was ordered for the killing, but by Carbo and not Lansky. So even outside of the boxing going on in the ring and all the bullshit that the fighters had to go through, you had the mob fighting amongst themselves to, to basically control everything that was going on you had a complete shift in power going on all the time in the background with all these different families going at each other all the time so it was even more difficult if you were a fighter who wanted to go somewhere because not only did you have to deal with all these scumbag managers that were skimming your money you also had to deal with the fact that you could quite easily be discarded and dropped at the bottom of the Hudson if you were no longer needed, or if you no longer adhered to anything that you were told to do. It was absolutely mental. It was a really just crazy time. I mean, and the crazy thing is, is when you read these interviews with some of the guys that were around at the time, it would be Lou Duva, even Teddy Atlas, there's a couple of others in there, but they all say that it was actually run really well. That's the craziness of the whole thing. You know, the way, the, what they felt that, because there was only eight titles around at the time, you was never going to fight for a world title, but you always managed. There was always a chance you'd get in on the garden and earn some money. It's crazy. It really is. That I mean, I mean, this wasn't just New York either. By this point now, they, I mean, many people described it as an octopus. They literally began to branch out to Chicago and into St. Louis, and you know, all the other crime families across the country were beginning to put their hands in their pocket and and get involved in this because, you know, it's easy money. So we're going to go on to the fixed fights situation now. And and so it was during the 30s that Carbo had actually forced him his way into the boxing alongside Uncle Mike, as we said, while working alongside a guy called, or a few of them, Etio, Eddie Coco, Jimmy Doyle, Champ Seagal, Felix Bocinocho, and Carbo's right-hand man, as we mentioned, who was Blinky Palermo. 
the group were actually known as the combination. And it was from this combination that, as I say, it was like an octopus. They just ended up branching out to all sorts of cities and states, I should say, across the country. And together, they were highly successful in fixing high-profile boxing matches. Now, in 1947, the New York State Athletic Commission revoked a guy, no one knows, Rocky Graziano's license for failing to report a pair of bribes that was offered to him. And he was still able to fight, but he was still able to fight in other states. So although they evoked the one from New York, he was able to fight somewhere else. I believe he went and fought Chicago after. Graziano always maintained his innocence, saying, years later, this is what he said in his own words, somebody called me on the phone in Stillman's gym and says, I'll give you $50,000 or some say $100,000 to throw this fight. And I told the guy to go, to, to go crap himself. But then the DA got wind of it. They say you're supposed to report that. I say, how can I report a thing? Anyone can come over and tell you that. So, interestingly, Graziano, who was a guy that was born in New York, raised in New York, and it, it just he ended up getting his call. He ends up getting suspended by someone giving him a call and offering him a bribe. It's crazy. It's funny, isn't it? It's, 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 it's quite funny how like these these sort of wicked webs all tie in together. It's funny because. One part of the story is something that I didn't know beforehand was that Graziano and Cabo actually went to the same Catholic reform school and Rocky would later end up in prison where he actually met Frankie Peppo, who was a connected face who told Rocky to go and see him when he gets out. So he did. <laughs> but he's greeted by a manager, Irving Cohen, and a trainer, Whitney Bimstein. More connected faces, but not Peppo. They would end up being Rocky's handlers for the rest of his career. So Rocky Graziano ended up being a connected fighter. He knew the mob through his Italian roots and living in Brooklyn, New York, there was nothing he could do about that. As was Jake LaMotta and Kid Gavilan, who came over from Cuban and was another fighter who fell in to the mob's grasps. So now we move into a particular fight which we've we've talked about in the past with the St. Valentine's Day massacre, only touched on it briefly. So, on November the 14th, 1947, Jake LaMotta was knocked out in the fourth round by Billy Fox and was suspected to have thrown the fight. The referee, Frank Fulham, spoke of his account of that fight and he said, if there was anybody at the garden who didn't know what was happening, he must have been dead drunk. <laughs> now, during the investigation, the New York State Athletic Commission withheld purses for the fight. 20% of the gate went to Fox and 30% went to LaMotta and suspended LaMotta at the same time. Three days before the fight, LaMotta was at his brother Joey's boxing club at the Park Arena. The truth is, the club was Jake's and not Joey's. He also owned the Jerome Stadium as another investment. Why he wanted to keep this a secret was because there were connected men that would attend the small clubs to bet on fights and it would be a conflict of interest because he was still an active fighter. The significance of the night on November the 11th was that Jake was present and so were his special guests who were Frankie Cabo and Blinky Pereiro. Now a boxing writer, Barney Nagler, observed from a distance and he wrote, They were godly, open-handed. The mobsters in the business usually were as cosy as dope pushers about their activities in boxing, but Cabo and Pereiro had chosen to consort with Jake LaMotta in a public fight club on a fight night when officials of the New York State Athletic Commission were near enough to smell them. It was blatant the night they agreed the fix and in the fight itself, but the New York State Athletic Commission could not prove it and LaMotta was suspended from boxing for seven months and fined $1,000 of his $20,000 purse. Now, LaMotta did eventually get a shot at the world middleweight title on June 16th, 1949, in Detroit, Michigan, going on to defeat the Frenchman Marcel Sedan. So, for Jake LaMotta at this point, it was the one fight in his career that, if you watch it, he wasn't knocked out. <laughs> He's fucking mental. He, he, it was the worst thrown fight you'll have ever seen. It was most blatant. If you're going to throw a fight... At least go down rolling around the floor a few times, pretending you've been hurt. This fight, you're literally just still standing because he never got knocked down in his career, as most people will know. And the fact that he just literally <laughs> just takes the punches and sort of like walks away as if to say, yeah, yeah, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. I've just, it's beyond belief how blatant it was 
that the fight was fixed. It was so blatant. And the fact that they met three nights before Carbo, Palermo, in Joey's boxing gym, that was actually Jake's, full of connected mobsters. I mean, it was pretty, it's pretty clear. Uh, and then you watch that fight, and Lamotta literally just stands there and lets Billy Fox pound him. It was, uh, it was so blatant. But end of the day, he was suspended for seven months. He got a thousand dollar fine. Still had nineteen thousand left. I think I don't think Lamotta was actually too bothered because he got that world middleweight title shot. At the end of it, there was a goal for Jake. You know, he's there as a middleweight fighting away, not getting no chances. They tend to throw a fight. He keeps saying no. Eventually, his brother sort of intervenes says look just do it he does it he gets his shot wins a title so I don't know there is an end goal there I suppose that was just the times you just sometimes you just had to go to bed with him as they say now Lamotta actually held the title until he lost to Sugar Ray Robinson in their sixth meeting and a fight that was obviously become known as the St Valentine's Day Massacre but before their first meeting in 1942 Robinson was training in a place called Pompton Lakes when he had a visitor and it was, it was Carbo. Ray actually recalled the meeting in his autobiography. Now, we have done Sugar Ray Robinson's uh, a long career profile. It's a good one. But this is something we didn't necessarily mention. I was always informed that it was a call. And I actually discovered that from this autobiography, it wasn't. And this is in his own words. This is in Ray's own words. He says, I strolled down to the gate near the road. Moments later, a big black sedan slowed to a stop. Ray, he said, I represent the ball. Yeah, I said, realising he was referring to Jake LaMotta. I've got a deal for us. What kind of deal? I want you and the ball to have three fights. You'll win the first, he wins the second. The first is on level. You mean I take a dive for the second? Either that, or you don't put out. Just so the ball wins. He'll let you have the first one, in the third, you're both on your own. The best man wins. You got the wrong guy, I said. Three fights is a lot of money, he said. You give the ball a message. You tell the ball to keep his hands up and his ass off the floor. You tell him to be sure to do that when the bell rings. Without waiting for an answer, I spun and I headed back to the house. So basically, Sugar Ray was actually approached, in his own words, by Frankie Carbo face-to-face in his car, goes to see him, and he turns him down flat. Carbo basically accepted Ray's decision without any backlash whatsoever. And although it did take Ray a a long time to finally get that welterweight title shot, which was actually 75th fight, to be exact, but because, as we mentioned earlier, because Sugar Ray Robinson was as great as he was, the mob didn't touch him. They didn't touch him. They they left him alone. Um, So it just shows you some of the biggest names in boxing Managed to get away with it. I don't know how Sugar Ray Robinson managed to get away with it, but again, I think when we when we did the career profile of Sugar Ray Robinson, it's quite obvious how much of a of a big star he was at the time. And we spoke about you know his investments and and how he'd drive around in his pink Cadillac. And you know if you've not heard if you've not heard that episode already, then please go and give it a listen. It's a long one, but it's one that's definitely worth listening to in terms of his whole life and his boxing career, inside and out. Now. Moving on to the next fixed fight, we'll move on to Gavilan, as in Kid Gavilan, or the Keed, as he was also known, would be the centre of a fixed fight on Wednesday, August the 29th, 1951, against local fighter Billy Graham for the NBA welterweight world title at the Garden in their third encounter. Now, the fight is still regarded as one of the most controversial decisions of all time. And the crowd showed their frustration at the result as they protested violently. All three judges favoured Gavilan. Mark Conn gave it 10 7, Arthur Schwartz 9 6, and Frank Forbes 10 11. When a ringside poll was actually conducted by the unofficial press, out of 15 boxing writers, they had 12 favouring Graham and only 3 favouring Gavilan. Gil Clancy, of the Hall of Fame boxing trainer and one of the most distinguished boxing commentators for the 1980s and 90s, recalled the fight and he said, That night, well, There was a bar we used to go to, Gray's Bar. The owner's name was Eddie Gray, right near the old garden. As soon as the bell rang at the end of the 15th round, I ran down to the place and said, Eddie, we've got a new world champion. He says, no you don't. I actually couldn't believe it. That's how bad I thought it was. 
It was a terrible decision. It was one of the tricks of the trade. The mob would have paid off all three of the judges and told them to make sure it wasn't going to be Graham's night. Five years on, and Gavilan lost to Peter Waterman, brother of actor Dennis, who appeared on Minder. So for any UK <laughs> TV fans, Minder was a, was a show in the 70s and 80s that people actually loved. So that was an even more bizarre decision to the one that we've previously just been speaking about. Now, Kidd won more or less every round, but he absolutely got shafted again in the Harringay Arena in London. But two months later, he won the rematch in Hill's Court. Another tactic from the mob for their fighters to lose one and then gain revenge before having an even rubber match. But the third fight actually never happened between between these two. Yeah, interesting. I think I think that's just kid. Kid was blatantly a, an associated fighter. I mean, he couldn't. He came over from Cuba and they they signed him up quickly. I think he he was the guy that actually he, did he not found the the bolo punch or something like that. And they they loved him there. And uh, he just basically ended up in a situation where he had nothing nowhere to go. I mean, what could he do? It just it just shows you the, the difference. You had the Billy Graham, who was one of from this fight, he got done by a kid. They loved him in New York, absolutely loved him. But he just never got a chance because he wasn't a connected man. As we said, just there are there were so many. That's the one thing I will say is there's so many in the fifties. There were some excellent fighters that we don't know about because they just never got given a chance because they didn't dance to to the mobsters' tune basically, and that was how it was. So Blinky Palermo. He had a stable of professional fighters uh, that he owned outright or under the table, including world welterweight champion Virgil Atkins, number three ranked heavyweight contender Clarence Henry and world welterweight champion Johnny Saxton and heavyweight contender Coley Wallace and the lightweight champion who was Ike Williams. Now, Williams actually testified before the Kiefer Commission investigating the mob of their control of boxing. And Williams told the commission that he was broke and was working for $56 per week, despite having won $1 million in purses. He claimed Palermo refused to pay him his share of the purses from two fights worth approximately $40,000 on which he had to pay taxes. He said he never tried to collect the monies owed to him by Palermo. So, it's a very vague t- touch on Ike Williams, but Ike Williams is quite possibly, looking at his resume, one of the best lightweights ever. He was just a very, it was unfortunate because he was signed up with Blinky. I, f- I believe, again, it was his manager who was a part of the gold that sold him to Blinky. Blinky owned him and he just shunned him. He, he literally took so much money from Ike Williams. And there is one fight in particular but I think Bud Schulberg, you, you'll speak about it in a minute, Sean. I think he mentions it. Kid Gavilan was quite literally shafted by the mob and in particular Blinky Palermo. And in a 2002 interview with The Observer, Bud Schulberg spoke about Carbo and his partner Palermo and their involvement in a 1954 welterweight championship fight. And he said, Frankie Carbo, the mob's unofficial commissioner for boxing, controlled a lot of the welters and middles. Not every fight was fixed, of course, but from time to time, Carbo and his lieutenants, like Blinky Palermo in Philadelphia, would fix, put the fix in. When the Kid Gavilan Johnny Saxton fight was won by Saxton on a decision in Philadelphia in 1954, I was covering it for Sports Illustrated, and I wrote a piece at the time saying boxing was a dirty business and must be cleaned up now. It was an open secret. All the press knew that one, and other fights were fixed. Gavilan was a mob-controlled fighter too, and when he fought Billy Graham, it was clear Graham had been robbed of the title. The decision would be bought. If it was close, the judges would shade it the way they had been told. Now, Dan Parker was a New York sports writer that didn't shy away from the blatant facts that many were too frightened to speak about, and he said, Promoters and managers in each other's pockets didn't need to fix that many fights. They only had to own most, or preferably all, of the fighters. A boxer was either in the loop and got the fights, or wasn't, and he didn't. He also went on to say, Evidence the New York State Crime Commission secured by wiretapping indicates that Carbo has a voice in the matchmaking decisions of the IBC. He is supposed to have named the list to matchmakers at Madison Square Garden and has been known to give them orders as well. Several of those fighters would not have had a clue that any of this was going on because 
fighters didn't even know such a guy even existed. Yep, and that's why they called him Mr. Grey. Carbo loved to just stick around in in the background and just just speak to uh, whether it be Norris or whether it be Uncle Mike before him or Gibson. Um, he would he would just he he run it basically. And by 1950, there wasn't a clear public consensus that a national organised crime syndicate was a big problem, and indeed that it even existed. Certainly there was evidence that there was or had been organised crime activity in Chicago, New York and a few of the other cities. Some experts, such as FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who was still clearly being blackmailed for his sexuality, denied the Mafia even existed. So it just shows you that as well. We sort of touched on that Hoover moment because Hoover still doesn't believe they existed. It's just, it's just crazy. They just had him in, they had him in their pocket. A series of hearings that were held by a special U.S. Senate committee in 1950 and 1951 changed that perception. Now, the hearings made it clear to a lot of people that there was a mafia and that they had power. Those hearings become known as the Kiefer hearings, which was we just spoke about with Ike Williams. He did mention he was a part of this. Uh, but the second one, after the committee's chairman, Senator C. Estes Kiefer of Tennessee. Now, the committee conducted 27 hearings in 14 cities with Frank Costello coming under intense questioning. Costello was the one who was intimidated and overwhelmed by his exposure on television. And he actually told his lawyer, George Wolfe, in his plea, saying, Mr. Cons- Mr. Costello doesn't care to submit himself to a spectacle, which was actually quite laughable because Costello was always a spectacle of himself. He loved to be in control. And this was the one time in these key hearings where you actually see Casello squirm. And it also brought to light that the mafia existed. And it also brought to light that they could be doing other stuff. And this is where we will go on in a minute to the second key for hearings. Now, to distract the authorities and discourage the perception that the IBC monopolised boxing, Norris and Wirtz formed the IBC of Illinois. Norris then took the next step of resigning as president of the IBC in New York, handing it over to Truman Gibson. The Garden then bought out the IBC and operated as a privately owned company. Now, Judge Sylvester Ryan of the US District Court decided the IBC of New York was indeed controlled by the mob and ordered its dissolution, giving Norris and Wirtz five years to separate themselves of their holdings, which was approximately 40% in the Garden. Judge Ryan also declared that the IBC of Illinois was also in a monopoly and ordered its closure too. They were basically given a slap on the wrist and were still able to go on about their business as normal. So even though these Kiefer hearings clearly showed that the IBC were being operated by the mob and the guys of of Norris and Gibson were basically monopolising that, you know, to give them five years to, to basically close... It just it's ridiculous but it did highlight something which is something that was key but the mob continued their reign of terror even after the first key for hearings now this is going back a little bit but ray arcel is recognized as one of the most successful boxing trainers during the 1920s and the 1950s he began training fighters at stillman's gym near the old location of madison the Square Garden on 8th Avenue in the 1920s, training a number of champions. I mean, just to select a few, there was a huge list, but the ones that we will all recall, if you're boxing fans, is Benny Leonard, Ezar Charles, Jim Braddock, Barney Ross, Bob Olin, Tony Zhao, Jackie Kid Berg, and his first world champion, who was Frankie Gennaro. Plus, as I say, many more. He's a host, a host of fighters. And Ray Arcel was a, an established trainer, as we all know. With complete disregard of his outstanding services and the respect he had earned within boxing, he was forced out of the fight game on September 19, 1953. Arcel was standing outside a Boston hotel, having just returned from Young Keeper Services, when he was struck in the forehead with a lead pipe. He suffered a concussion, spent 19 days in hospital, and was lucky he wasn't killed. The reason for the attack was actually due to Arcel becoming a threat to the IBC Corporation when he began arranging fights for the ABC TV. It was rumoured that Carbo was not happy with Arcel after his refusal to work alongside the IBC or pay them a percentage of his earnings. 
Instead, he went up against the power machine, resulting in Ray Arcel becoming a marked man. Not long after the attack, Arcel retired from boxing for 18 years. Arcel actually said later, money is the sickness of the boxing business. Maybe it's the sickness of the world. And we all know, what, 19 years later, he comes out of retirement to help a certain Roberto Duran, even Ray. He, I believe he didn't sign up to the gold, Ray. I think that was another thing. So it just shows you that even though he was this huge, huge trainer, I mean, Ray Arcel is one of the legendary trainers in boxing history. And the fact that he spent 19 years out of the game because of the mob, I think this is definitely something we needed to mention. Oh, absolutely. Of course he was. It was such a shame that he spent so many years out of the game. Just imagine what he would have done and what champions he would have produced. Some of these guys that never maybe made it as, as big as what they could have done could have had that with, with Ray Arcel's mentorship. And it's funny because, just as a side note, the, the film that they brought out a couple of years ago, the Roberto Duran film that they did, actually does depict a moment in there where they're speaking about this particular moment where he was attacked, and then as he decides to come back to help Roberto Duran, supposedly he was threatened once more to basically go back to what you were doing and don't help Roberto Duran, otherwise this time you're going to get it. And but the rest is history, of course. And obviously, he went on to, to help Roberto Duran, as we know. So it just goes to show you that even years later, they had this influence over boxing. No matter how many years had passed, they still had this influence over certain people within the industry. Now, there were many other leading coaches during the same period that a lot of people believe did not play ball with the IBC, but yet did not fall victim to these intimidation techniques. Customato was one of those trainers. Teddy Atlas, he, who he fought under and worked with closely, speaks of D'Amato during the height of corruption in boxing. And Teddy Atlas said, Cus was a part of the manager's guild, yes, but he fought the IBC. And he thought that in the end, he was some way a part of their downfall. So why is that D'Amato was not intimidated the same way that Ray Arcel was if he was fighting against the same organisation? And now Teddy Atlas lifted the lid when speaking with Kevin Phillips for his book and he said, Later on, when I left Cuss, some of those reasons were maybe brought out a little. Cuss had always talked about a guy he was friends with called Charlie Black. I actually found out Charlie Black's real name, Charlie Antonucci. And Charlie Antonucci was cousins with Fat Tony Salerno. Now Tony Salerno <laughs> at the time was the head of one of the biggest mob families in the country. So Cus being a guy that was wearing a collar and fighting this good fight and somehow mysteriously the rain never fell on him, suddenly it's maybe a tiny bit explainable that he was with Charlie Black. Two and two is usually four and I don't have to be Nostradamus or Columbo to say that it is maybe why he wasn't bothered. Interesting. Customato was always a guy that said he would never ever get involved in the mob but yet later on you find out he's friends with a with a guy that actually Charlie and, and Tanucci was cousins with I mean it is a, a there is a link there and I think it's clear to see if Customato didn't play ball with a mob then they were going to do their business no matter how big you are and this for me I mean Ray Arcel is bigger than Cust that's just my honest opinion when you look at the fighters that Ray trained and the world champions he had I believe he was bigger than Cuss, but yet Cuss, you know, he didn't want to sing to their tune, but he must have had connections. That's why they didn't touch him. So before Cuss took control of the world heavyweight title, which was in 1956 with his protege, Floyd Patterson, there was another heavyweight that ruled the division from 1950 to 1955, sorry, and that was Rocky Marciano. On October 26, 1951, The Rock from Brockton, Massachusetts, took on the 37-year-old Joe Lewis and mate, the good guy Joe Lewis at the Garden. Coming into the bout, Marciano was interestingly a six and a half to five underdog. And Marciano actually knocked Lewis through the ropes and onto the ring apron in the fifth round. This was a change in the bat and butt was also a sad fight to watch. If you're a Joe Lewis fan like I am, it's not a fight I watch. I watched it once and I won't be watching it again. And The Rock would go on to dominate the heavyweight division for the next five years. He retired undefeated, obviously, as we know, all those that, that do watch the boxing and love the boxing, with a record of 49-0. There was no proof to confirm that Marciano had any ties with the mob but his manager, Al Will, was 
as an associate of Frankie Carbo. And first meeting with Roland Lestraza at the Garden in 1950 did stink of corruption. Even the crowd were heard to be shouting fix. Jesse Abrahamson of the New York Daily Herald called the decision paper thin and exceedingly odd. According to newspaper result, reports, it was condemned around ringside as a miscarriage of justice. If judges were told to make sure it wasn't Roland's night, which is something, again, you know, it's, it's, it's a saying that the mob always make sure it's not going to be such and such as night. And that's basically what it was when Rocky probably was actually kept in the dark. This is, again, I, the reason why we say that Rocky was kept in the dark is because actually Rocky retired so early in his career because of his manager, Al Will, and he wouldn't dance to his tune. And he did it to spite him. That was the rumours, and that's why apparently he retired as early as he did. But on October 31st, 1969, a day before his 46th birthday, as we all know, Rocky Marciano died in a plane crash. Custom Auto's guy, Patterson, finally got his hands on the World Heavyweight title vacated by Marciano when he retired against Archie Moore on November the 30th, 1956 in Chicago and he would hold that title to ransom and out of the clutches of the IBC for as long as he possibly could. In the end, Patterson actually forced his hand and he actually ignored the advice from Custom Auto and he, he gave Sonny Liston, who at this point is heavily affiliated with the mob as you've heard earlier in the season with our inaugural episode the life and mysterious death of Sonny Liston he gave him that title shot against the advice of Custom Auto and of course Sonny Liston absolutely beat the shit out of him in 1962 and in 1963 so it meant that once again the mob held the most prestigious title in boxing well at least for a couple of years anyway now Liston's links to mobsters are endless John Vitale was a Sicilian-American boss and underboss of the St. Louis crime family who first guided Liston before handing him over to Palermo. Ivan Ash Resnick, the Thunderbird Hotel and Casino operator in Las Vegas that was linked to the New York Mog, also became an influential figure during and after Liston's boxing career. Of course, we're referring mainly to the first episode of the season when we covered that particular supposed fixed fight with Cassius Clay, a la Muhammad Ali. We didn't really need to, we, we don't need to go into so much with Sonny Liston. If you, if you don't know, I'll be surprised. Go back and listen to the, that first episode of our Dark Side of Boxing, because there's a lot of information on there about these guys and just exactly how affiliated Liston was to the point of his murder, we believe. Now, the next part is the fall of Carbo, Palermo, Norris and Gibson Jr., so with the FBI breathing down their necks, the decision from the Kiefer hearings was upheld after an unsuccessful appeal for, uh, with Norris and Wirtz announcing they were now going to sell their interest in the garden to the Gray and Page Corporation, which was a New York investment company. You would have thought that Carbo, Palermo and Gibson would have decided to cut their losses. Well, they did the complete opposite. And it would actually be the biggest mistake they ever made. And Virgil Atkins was an average welterweight uh, that Carbo decided should be steered to the world title held by Carmen Basillo. They drew up a list of opponents and presented it to Norris, who agreed and passed it on to the appropriate state boxing commissions for their approval, which, of course, they accepted. Again, I mean, the links there, how the hell they just... There was always somebody somewhere as the heat turned up on Carbo, the plan still continued and Atkins did win the world welterweight title against Vince Martinez in 1958. Now, however, his reign was short-lived as the IBC did not count on a certain Don Jordan, who was actually trained by Eddie Futch at the time to upset the apple cart. Atkins was due to be the world champion for at least the next couple of years. Palermo specifically warned Jordan's manager, John Nessif, to make sure that his man did not perform to the best of his ability. Nessif refused, so in an attempt to claw something back, Palermo demanded that he give him up to 50% of his interest in the fighter and they would allow the fight to end fairly. Once again, Nessif and the promoter, Jackie Leonard, refused. Instead, he went to Gibson in hope that he could persuade Palermo to back off, which was unsuccessful. Instead, they stood firm 
and decided to not accept any bribery or extortion for the best interests of the fighter. Now, Palermo began with threatening calls to Leonard with his associates, Joe Seeker and Lou Dragner. So Leonard went to the police, only to be told, play ball or get your comeuppance. And one night, when Leonard was closing his garage door, he was jumped on by a couple of thugs who gave him an absolute shit kicking. And then they petrol bombed his house. Bums on Skid Row were even offered $250 to beat him up. But Leonard stood firm and Jordan went on to win the fight at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. Now, this is a guy who had the biggest grapefruits you have ever heard of. The fact that he fucking stood up to Palermo and his goons and his bums on Skid Row, the fact that he stood up to these guys, got the shit kicked out of him, had his house burnt down to a fucking crisp, but yet still manages to get out of it and his fighter goes on to still win the fight out of her all that. It just goes to show you at this point in time though, doesn't it, that the fact that these people were starting to stand up to these guys at this point was starting to prove that the tide was starting to turn a little bit. I think so. And I think the fact that they began to start with this, I mean, they were always extreme and they would use a lot of intimidation and they would go ahead with a lot of their intimidation tactics. But to hear this one and, and for it to not work out, I mean, all I kept reading was Palermo was just confused and baffled. He could not believe that this guy <laughs> is standing up to him. So, you know, Leonard, I take me out after Jackie Leonard, he, he's a refusal when he backed his man. I mean, that's the sort of promoter that, that boxing needed. So Palermo obviously was pissed and he was ready to take his intimidation taxes to the next level. We don't know exactly. I'm guessing probably swimming in that Hudson River. But federal authorities got wind of the situation and moved in. The California State Athletic Commission, the Los Angeles Police Department and the boys from the Bureau all worked together to bring the underworld of boxing to a standing camp. Carbo, Palermo, Norris and Gibson, plus Sika and Dragner, were all rounded up and charged with conspiracy to violate the Federal Anti-Racketeering Act, interstate communications, extortion and conspiracy. But Gibson only accused of conspiracy. The following year, in 1960, the Senate Subcommittee on Antitrust and Monopoly chaired by Senator Estes Kiefer, held hearings into organised crime professional boxing. It was revealed that the IBC had ties to mafioso Frankie Carbo. At the time of the hearings, Carbo was actually imprisoned on Rikers Island, having been convicted of the undercover management of prize fights and unlicensed matchmaking. The hearings actually revealed that Carbo's wife was employed by the IBC at a salary of $45,000 a year. The FBI compiled half a million pages on Carbo during their investigations over the years under all of his aliases. And all of his aliases, Frankie Carbo was known as Mr. Gray, Paul L. Carbo, PJ Carbo, Frank Fortunato, and Frank Marlowe, and also Jimmy the Whoop, apparently <laughs> a name that everybody else called him. He didn't like that. No one would actually said that to his face. But looks like things are definitely starting to turn, and the IBC and the underlying underworld are basically coming to a crumble. The following year, Carbo and Palermo were charged with conspiracy and extortion against National Boxing Association welterweight champion Don Jordan. After a three-month trial in which US Attorney General Robert Kennedy served as a prosecutor, the defendants were convicted and sent to federal prison. Ike Williams and Jake LaMotta both testified with Jake LaMotta admitting to throwing the Billy Fox fight. Carbo, who pleaded the fifth with his famous line, I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself, was actually sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he served his sentences at Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary in California, McNeil Island in Washington State, and the United States Penitentiary Marion in Illinois. He was granted early parole due to ill health and released from prison, and he died in Miami Beach in Florida on November the 9th, 1976. Now, for Palermo... He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he served seven and a half of those 25 years. Norris actually suffered from heart problems and had two heart attacks, and he died in Chicago in 1966 at the age of 59. 
with a reported net worth of $250 million. Gibson was sentenced to five years probation and fined and continued to reside in Chicago and practice law up until his death on December the 23rd. 2005 so that was it that was the end of the car by rain and the ibc yeah it ended badly i suppose for him they still had ties with liston i mean that was the other thing liston was even from prison these guys were still able to to, to do their business which is something obviously we mentioned in the liston episode so you know go back and listen to that the next thing is it, we were going to jump ahead here because it was the, the only real last story that ever came out in the press was from a mob associate. It actually came out on April Fool's Day as well in 1993, which did make me laugh. It makes you wonder whether they're just pissing about. And former Gambino underboss Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano testified before a Senate permanent subcommittee in investigations that John Gotti actually wanted fight promoter Don King killed because King described himself as a tough guy who had done time and didn't want to get involved with John Gotti in that, as he said, BS as bullshit. He also testified that the co-managers of Buddy McGirt, Al Sertismo and Stuart Weiner were associates of the New York Gambino crime family. He said in his own words, Al Serto was a family associate. He is with John Joe Corozzo who is a made member of the Gambino family. A fixed fight really doesn't happen anymore, but our family has had interest in Buddy McGirt. Al Serto is a Gambino associate. Now, what Sammy was basically implying is that Serto had a fight fixed between Buddy McGirt and Penel Whitaker when Buddy earned a million dollars. To be honest, as the old Italians in, in the mobsters say, I believe it is a load of old baloney. And I think he was just a guy that loved to sing which is what he was well known for he was the guy that actually put john gotti away by testifying in a court of law bit of a prick to be honest with you um, a lot of them were that was the last real story to come out of mob ties associated with boxing and fixed fights but we can finish you off with uh, is it around i mean it's asked the question sean i mean what would you would you make of all this i think overall as we've gone through the course of the timeline of of how boxing and the mafia have become affiliated and how that relationship has been over the years it's quite evident that they've absolutely shafted so many fighters over the years and they've absolutely had this stronghold over it for a, a, a long 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 time and even some of these crime families that you refer to some of them are actually still around today in new york maybe They've learned from the lessons and they're not as... Whatever they're doing, they're doing it in the background and they're not being heard and they're not being seen by by doing it. But I think around the course of the sort of 70s and 80s, it was quite prominent with the, with the five families in New York in particular were quite well known and they were more... They were more well publicised at that point, I think, in, in, in time. If social media would have been around at that period of time, they would have been absolutely everywhere at that point in time. Absolutely. I think, does it exist today? I think that's the question that we've got to kind of ask ourselves. I mean, we, we sit on a weekly basis doing all sorts of different episodes. Sometimes we're just we're, we're chewing the fat over boxing in the UK and, and some of the shows and the judges and the corruption. Sometimes we feel like, you know, some things could be better, but... I think we've got to ask ourselves truly, is 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 there any mob ties affiliated with boxing anymore? Well, for me, if there is, they're doing it in a very good way because nobody even knows it's going on at the moment. Nobody knows about it. Nobody hears about it. I don't feel like there's been anything over the past 10, 15 years where I could honestly say I feel like something has been fixed by an outside entity or a third party. I genuinely don't feel like that is the case. I think with boxing today, it gives the opportunity for a lot of shit weasels to, to get involved in the sport. But these are just these are just harmless parrots that are basically going around and affiliating themselves with people and repeating the phrases they're saying and then coming back and saying the same things themselves to make themselves look better. I think that's all we've got in boxing at the moment. I think the second question is, has boxing changed that much from the 1950s and 60s? Uh, is it still as corrupt as what it seemed then? To be honest, I don't, I don't think it is as corrupt. I think the biggest issue in boxing at the moment, as we've always discussed, is obviously performance enhancing drugs. If there's anything that's in boxing at the moment that's so prevalent, 
it's peds. It's as simple as that. It's peds. I don't think it's corruption. I think the peds is the biggest issue in boxing at the moment. But what do you think about the story of, of boxing and the mafia? And what do you think about them questions, Johnson? Do you think that there are some ties to boxing still? And do you think that it has changed from what it was in the 50s and 60s? Definitely. I think, well, not, I say definitely. It has in terms of, I don't believe that anyone from the mob would be involved in it. I think you know, I'm not. I'm not silly or naive enough to think that they don't exist. I think they. I mean, as you can see, you can check on Wiki and you see that all the bosses of all the five families. There's someone's name there, and it says from such and such date till present, uh, they're still considered to be the head name of of that sort of crime family. But I don't believe they would really go into boxing. I just there's a lot of money in boxing today. You could compared to what it used to be, they don't hold that same hold. So I wouldn't say the mob necessarily, but I would say that. There are certain characters that have been created from the mob and learnt from the mob and learnt from other promoters that also dealt with, like like your Uncle Mike, that bastard Uncle Mike and and Jim Norris, for instance, who obviously went back to his hockey stuff, I think, with with the NHL. And and Gibson, who was a a lawyer that just got caught up in this situation and he'd become a bad person for a period. Again, I, I don't think the mob is affiliated anymore. I just think there's other sports they could probably or other ways, other means of earning money today, whether it be money laundering or whatever. But in terms of boxing, I don't think it's as corrupt as it was, but I suppose I'm with it. With the drugs, the drug situation with fires is definitely an issue. And uh, you've got to look at who are the new mobsters, if you like. And I think it's probably the governing bodies and it's the promoters, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. You know, some of the decisions that they make today, and then we sit here and read and, and investigate what the mob did, and uh, what other state, like the New York State Commission, which was uh, uh, mentioned a lot, you can't help but say that some of this stuff still happens. I still believe today that I would not be surprised whether it be a promoter or a manager of a fighter that is wealthy enough, they could quite easily wind and dine a judge. And that that the ruling that I always assumed fixed fights was always the thing, but it was just to get a cut of someone, to skim someone, to skim a fighter in terms of what they're earning. I think that happens today. I do believe promoters will still do that. I believe managers will do that. They will cut ties. We've had it with our career profiles. The amount of promoters that fall out of fires because they've done a amount of money. That is learnt from that's like a mob tactic, isn't it? So I think yeah. that still exists. And I do believe that judges get wind and dined. Because we see some of these judges, Sean, and some of these scorecards today, and you can't help but scratch your head. I mean, I just think, well, first thing that comes to me, look at Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder. How the hell? Did that happen? How was that a draw? Look at Canelo and Golovkin, first fight. What the hell was that judge? What was her face? I can't forget her name, but what the hell was she watching? Because we certainly were watching the same fight. I do believe that someone could have been in her ear and told her, you know, you do this and we can we can sort you out something later on, whether it be a few years down the line. That, I, I think it's still there. I believe that the corruption is there. It's just not through the mob. You know what? Now you've put it like that, I think... I think most people that are listening will probably agree with with what you're saying because when you've put it into that context for me, I'm thinking, actually, you know what? He's right because you've got these fighters that come out years down the line and say, I've been robbed of money off this promoter. I've been robbed of money off that promoter. This promoter never paid me the money. He should have paid me for these fights. So that is, in a way, it's kind of, it's mob tactics in a way. It might not be as brash and and, and as arrogant as, as the mob ones was, but it it is kind of stemming from 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 the way they used to do things and their organization used to do things so it's like the new age mobsters <laughs> are essentially <laughs> the dirt the dirty promoters the naughty promoters that we that we speak about and and some of these promoters provide us some of these great fights i mean how many times have we spoke about don king over the years yeah he put some amazing fight cards on but yeah he was an absolute bastard to to a lot of the fighters that he was involved with and when we do look at an episode regarding Don King, you're going to hear much more about his life and some of the stories that come out about him and the ones that we've shared so far, I think give you a bit of a flavour of that. Although these mobsters were part of of an organised crime syndicate, guys like Don King, guys that were uh, around that have been doing these things for over the years, although they might not be classed as mobsters and part of that crime organisation, essentially they are committing crimes in their own right so they are learning, as you say from, from these tactics of years gone by and just doing it in a way that is, is is a bit more subtle and makes it a little bit more easier for them to get away with it 
and that's the that's the shitty part about it. So when we when we ask the question, is corruption still in boxing? I think the answer for us has got to be yeah, it is. It, in some capacity, it is still there. Absolutely, and and you mentioned old dodgy Don King, Mister Slippery. I mean, his tactics is so mob style. You you think about it in terms of the way they you know with, with the with the managers guild, for instance, where they have a manager sign up and the fighter is basically associated with them. How many times did we see Don King go into a ring with one fire and come out of the ring with a guy that won? Um, <laughs> or even in his contracts, he would have a contract that would say, you know, my guy's the world champion, but when uh, you sign this contract to fight him, if you win, I'll get 30% of your earnings. That is just, that is such a, a mob style way of doing business some people may call it gangster but it was just the way he would go about it Don King I suppose is the fact that he would always laugh about it and just had this way this aura about him that even though he'd done some of the dodgy I mean rumbling in the jungle look who he's doing business with a, a mass murderer yeah. around a country I mean you can't get any more flipping gangster than that I mean uh, for me uh, I think Don King is probably a result of that. <laughs> I think he's just, he must have been what he must have watched so many mob films, and he, someone must have been in his ear to to, to pick up all these tactics because he just had the gift of the gab. He could charm his way into any anything, and and you can't deny it. He he delivers so many fantastic fights. Hence why he always comes up because he's always a part of them. Yeah. But is it because he's the one that's doing it? He's he's not necessarily the matchmaker. He just sees the gold at the end of the rainbow and he picks the right fighters. He, he knows where the money is. Oh, he certainly um, bloody so does now. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't he? <laughs> he certainly does now. But yeah, it's, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's been a, a really interesting episode to sit down and do it. I mean, the darker side of boxing has been all about murders and conspiracies. And, and this one's about cold hard facts, really. This one's been about actual truth to, to the to the matter and it's been an enjoyable episode to sit down and, and record for the sole fact is that it's a topic that really does epitomize what the darker side of boxing is all about you've got mob-handed tactics you've got corruption you've got murder you've got all sorts of different variables to to how these two went hand in hand with each other for so so long that we've really enjoyed investigating it bringing all the information together for you to listen to and i hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed listening to the episode and obviously there there were other bits of information that that always could be put into the episode but again how much do you do you want us to provide that you don't already know? So we we've been glad to be able to give you a near two hour podcast which has kind of summarised all the main parts of what boxing and the mafia was all about over the years. So if you've enjoyed it, of course, make sure now you go and leave us a five-star rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts and let us know your thoughts on the darker side of boxing, the series, the episodes. Let us know. Give us a five-star review and follow us on Twitter at darker underscore sky underscore pod. And then the Facebook page is the BTR Boxing Podcast Network where you can find all our other series, including Legendary Nights, Career Profiles and the main BTR Boxing Podcast feed. It's been a pleasure as always to do another episode for the darker side of boxing. You've been listening to Boxing and the Mafia.